Welcome to the Heart of Healthcare podcast. In series three, we'll be talking about healthcare from a global perspective, offering deep discussions about what it will take for a system shift that will benefit patients and healthcare professionals when medicine is practiced from the heart. We'll be hearing from Stephanie Mo Davis, Drs. Ruby Shah, Dan Dinenberg, and Diane Bonhoeffer as they share insights and wisdom from their personal experiences. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, hello everyone. Hi, Ruby. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Dan. How are you all over the globe? <laughs> Wonderful. You look radiant and well. <laughs> Great. Excited we for have, the conversation. Yeah, <laughs> we have, we're really, whoa, we're getting deeper and deeper in it, right? So um, in our last conversation, we talked about meaning and potential and purpose and and how we derive meaning and potential and purpose from a an eye to eye compassionate interaction between healthcare professionals and patients and we realized that it's less about the outcome right so the purpose is not to reach a certain medical outcome as we define it in you know research studies and medical research studies so that some measurable parameter about our physical body has changed um, and so therefore the treatment works. So therefore we have achieved our purpose. We've done our thing, <laughs> but actually what really feels like a purpose as a healthcare professional, what feels like a purpose and, and what gives meaning to being a healthcare professional and meaning to being a patient with the current condition is, is way different <laughs> and is actually hardly ever defined or measured as the kind of outcome that we know otherwise from from medical outcomes and what we also realize is that this meaning and this compassionate togetherness um, is an experience in the present moment so it's less about something we want to achieve in the future but it is an experiential um, uh, togetherness <laughs> in a situation that is now that is right now and if we open up to being right now then that's what makes such a huge difference? That tiny, seemingly tiny difference makes this huge difference. And so what is this? And this is what we wanted to explore further today and talk about resonance. So what is it that happens in this moment now? And what is it that makes the difference between a moment that feels like meaningful and purposeful um, as compared to one where we're kind of mechanicking and roboting along or where we're kind of playing some role game. So let's unpack this and let's see, let's just start and see, do we have a similar understanding of resonance and what that, what does this mean and how does it show up? Let's just uh, take a turn. So I don't know, Ruby, do you want to get started? For me, this is a word that I've recently really understood outside of <laughs> physics <laughs> Um, and so um, it was more so attaching this word to an experience that I definitely had had before I understood what this word means. Um, so now I can tell you that the only way I can describe this word, define it, is by describing my experience of resonance, <laughs> which um, is when there's a, a, a meeting in a space and it doesn't, it's not physical space. Um, but I, I, I think it's important to define that there's a space, um, because that means that there's a mutual existence in the now, just like you said, Jan, um, that's how I experience it, where I feel, um, seen and heard. Um, that's how I've experienced this. Um, and then in retrospect, I was able to identify that when I have resonance with another individual in the past, before I even knew the word to attach to it, it was when the other person feels an instant, deep connection to me. Mm -hmm. And that was oftentimes patience because that's where I spent the majority of my time. And mm -hmm. that's when you have this really unique experience of total stranger and this instant connection. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen with every single patient. Yeah. Does it happen with every single patient? Of course, I've had that feeling of resonance with other individuals who are not patients, but 
I, I gotta say, I've, I've, I was more easily able to attach it. I experienced it more so with patients than, than other individuals. Beautiful. So when I hear you correctly, then, then you're describing an awareness of a mutual existence in space that has an instant, that is instantly recognized when this resonance happens, when this connection happens, this mutual recognition happens. Great. Wow. That's beautiful. An awareness of a mutual existence in space that leads to an instant recognition of coexistence. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Who wants to go next? (laughs) That's a beautiful definition, but (laughs) Stephanie, go for it. I would like to add in a little bit from my perspective. Um, First, I can identify with what Ruby's saying from a patient practitioner point of view is the, the dynamic of the relationship between the patient and the provider is that the patient is coming in seeking something. Most often, how do I get well? What do I have to do to stay alive? Or what do I have to do to stay well? So there's a deep openness coming from the patient of I want to be completely vulnerable in this space. And I am fully present because this is the most important thing to me. So I believe that the patient enters the space. Uh, it, it's very open from that patient point of view of I need to be present because my life may depend on it. Hmm. So what we're met hmm. with may not always reflect in that same openness, depending on the time, what's going on in the thought patterns, the the mental formulations, the this patient before, this patient after, I have to do this. So I think that what can happen, and this is probably the largest complaint I hear from the patient population aggregate that I work with is, I don't feel seen, I don't feel heard, and I don't feel understood. This is a classic feminine archetypal wound, right? So it just kind of shows to me that there's definitely an opportunity for us to do better to understand some of the underpinnings of the importance of space, holding space, showing up in the moment fully present and identifying resonance. And I just want to challenge the space between us here to, to try to broaden our perspective to see that maybe, just maybe, resonance always exists but instead we show up trying to cohere it with our understanding. Mm -hmm. So I think that very often coherence is a more three-dimensional mental way to understand resonance, but the healing to me occurs in the resonance space. Mm -hmm. Boom. Yes. Thank you. Wow. (laughs) This is very beautiful. Wow. That is so beautifully put. That is so. But the kicker is that. The problem is, is that this isn't the way the traditional system operates and values how we evolve. So we can't measure this. This is something that can, as of this point, it's not even valued enough to truly be studied. But maybe the deeper question is, why do we have to put a measure on it if it's clearly working? What is it within us? Is there a trust issue within ourselves to not just connect the way we know we need to connect and desire to connect, that we we are blocking and actually doing more harm than we realize by trying to quantify everything. Wow, amazing. I think you, wow, you're touching on a few really core aspects here, I think. So one, if I hear from you correctly, then one of the things you're saying is that um, resonance is pre-existing and yes. it's not man-made right? Yes. So okay. it's resonance is there and we can, we can step out of resonance. We can disconnect, we can disconnect. Mm-hmm. Unknowingly can, most often. Right. Um, the, the, the fundamental state is a state of resonance. Mm-hmm. Um, because from a state of disconnection, it is perceived as something we need to do. Cause yeah. if I'm alone in this world, what else can I do then to create a connection with the world? Yes. So, so that fallacy is kind of, is understandable. So then once I connect, what, what, as I have this longing to reconnect, it looks like something I need to do. That opens the whole market of you're not good enough. You're not clean. You need to improve the whole self-improvement kind of business. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's, that, that works there. <laughs> and And actually what you're saying, if I hear you correctly, is 
it's the, if we let go of this mentalization, <laughs> if we let go of this concept, then we recognize we're already there. And that's where that instant connection happens because it's it, it just naturally falls into place. That's why it's instant as you, as Ruby, as you described it. Right? Mm -hmm. That is very, very beautiful. And then the second thing you were touching on was the measurability, right? It's like, why do we need to measure, right? There's, if you... If you know, you just know. There's no, there's no point in measuring something that you know, right? So if we, if we ask ourselves, do you, do you love your beloved? Right? Then you say yes. I say, well, give me the evidence. What are you going to say? It's just like, come on, just leave me alone, right? So I know. I just, I don't need evidence, right? I, I know that. That's another point. And so is the idea of, now let me challenge that a little bit. And because one of the assumptions that I think is connected with that, again, is that measuring has to do with objectifiable, linear kind of device type of measuring, right? So what we would call a scientific type of measuring. Now, if we're including the measure, I know, mm -hmm. if we accept I know mm -hmm. as an outcome, as a measurement, do you know? Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Great. That's a one zero outcome, right? I'm sure, I know. So, but we're not accepting that. We're not taking that into the equation. So possibly we could say, yes, we can measure it because you do actually. You, you, by saying, I know <laughs> when it happens, you do actually kind of assess. There's some sort of assessment going on, but we're not accepting this part of evidence as part of our so-called scientific evidence. Uh -huh. So maybe we can, if we add this to our paradigm, possibly... We could even say that actually it is very measurable, directly even measurable. It's a subjective measurement like pain and possibly there's some quantification like pain scales or something. It doesn't help anybody but researchers, but but at least there is something. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So let's let's take this a little bit further here. So we have a it's a shared space. It's Showing up in vulnerability in this shared space, there's an immediate subjective recognition that we can assess at least, that we can be aware of. And it is something that we don't need to do. It is something that we can uh, fall into. Wow. Amazing. Dan, you want to take it further? Even in this resident field that we're creating here, I feel like I've already... Um, <laughs> moved into a different understanding of resonance. It's really interesting to kind of discuss as it's um, shifting and changing kind of my idea, because I think what Stephanie mentioned of already being in that resonant field, I just immediately thought of nature itself. Mm -hmm. When I'm in that vibrational field, that resonance of nature, you understand that everything is happening. There's dying and decomposing and there's birth and regeneration and there's movement and there's, it's just, it's just, it's just flow and it's just being in that. And so it really helps, as we said that, to kind of move away from what's really understanding, because I'll take it back and kind of starting in almost a definition, um, you know, I see it as this, you know, a relationship of mutual understanding and trust, which we've touched on right now. But I also thought of it from a physics model, just to kind of take the listener of, you know, in, in theory, in physics, it's this idea of kind of a vibrating system or an external force driving another system to oscillate with greater amplitude, sort of like the swing. I'm pushing my daughter on the swing and I'm putting an external force on at the exact right moment where you're increasing the amplitude. And so that's kind of the idea of that. But it's funny yeah. to kind of take that away from, because we're now moving into the force that I'm pushing on. Is it just there anyway? Is there an intentionality to it? And then what we're talking about now is, not the scientific proving of that, but our own experience of that. And I know when I'm working with my clients and I am what I consider, and I just call it kind of like out of the way. So I've done my work and I'm in love and I'm in a vibrational field. What comes through is much more ease and grace. It's much more alignment and it's much more directive to what we're trying to get to. So it's sort of the noise moves away and we're becoming a little bit more 
vulnerable and trusting. And so the questions that I'm asking are more geared to what really needs to come out. And so it's just like an unfolding that occurs. It's actually just like it's naturally there and it's happening. And then all of a sudden it's getting closer to the diagnostic or what needs to happen or what is the treatment of that of the person. And it's coming from the resident field. So I trust that. And I believe that because I've experienced that. Where and how do you take a a more accurate, a more vibrational, more resonant understanding of the planet and bring that into our evolution in sort of this linear three-dimensional world that we're living in, this is where, quote unquote, the rubber meets the road. I mean, this is why this conversation is so important because it's like, what do we do to create that space? So for myself, I'll just kind of speak to that. It's like the more that I have learned, the more that I know, the more that I'm actually probably confident in, in what I'm doing as a physician the more that I actually allow vulnerability and space to enter into it. And it's like this funny little inverse proportion of, you know, when I didn't really know I was really scientific and I wore my white coat and I was much more like, it's like the more that I, you know, am doing my work well, the more that I'm stripped away from all of it in that vulnerable space. So I think that's a place just to move from, because I think, How do we bring that together? We're we're creating something here. The definitions are beautiful. And um, I think the last thing I'll just mention is, you know, Jan, you started with the eye to eye. Mm. And you mentioned that in sort of like, obviously, like the eye to see, but it's the eye to eye (laughs) without even realizing you said it, but it's the eye to eye to the we. Mm-hmm. And so right. just bringing that in that you also just by without even trying being in a resonant field, it's just you're actually saying it in a way that actually speaks to the greater we. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. <laughs> well, we're really jamming here today again. <laughs> this is amazing. Very, very beautiful. Dan, you're just connecting two dots for me here. This, I was kind of struggling with this for, for for many months now with the idea, what is primary, right? Is love primary or is love the result of speech and action, right? And it became clear fairly soon that the question is wrong as usual. So (laughs) the, the question is not helpful, right? So and it became clear that the or is probably the problem. <laughs> it's not one or the other, but what's the connection? Like, where do they actually meet? And Ruby, you were pointing to it. Stephanie, you were pointing to it. And I think now as it's building up, I think Dan with intention, that connects the two. And that's the amplifying effect that you were talking about. So recognizing what is very clear to me, like where I don't need evidence, is that resonance is our primary state of being. That is obvious to me. Right, not to my brain, but to to all the rest of it. Right, <laughs> and now um, there is if that is primary, and I, I just know that's the case. I can't measure it, but somehow there is a deep knowing that that is so. And yet, actually doing things that are loving and saying things that are loving, they create more of it. So, and maybe that's the thing with this swing that you are describing, right? So yeah, I am that resonance. Now, if I actually do something that is meaningful and, and loving and caring and compassionate, then I'm just kind of, that, that amplifies, I'm going into resonance with the already resonant field that exists. And, and as I get into that rhythm, then, aha, that can instantly be felt by the one <laughs> receiving that push because they're in that frequency anyway, aware or not aware. Beautiful. Wow. This is drop. Does that, does that make sense to you as well? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Like for me, this is really connecting two dots that have been sitting next to each other for a long while now. <laughs> That's, that's very beautiful. So in intention, that, that it really shows the, the incredible importance of intention. And, and if I take what Stephanie is saying, then it's actually the intention of letting go. <laughs> it's, it's the intention of not mentalizing. And it's, it's not the intention of the illusion state of separation. <laughs> it, is, it is an intention to, it's not the intention to create love, but it's the intention to, let love be. 
<laughs> and mm-hmm. and drop into this space and that then actually allows me from this new place to have an intention of augmenting yeah. like participating okay. in the rhythm and and like sitting on the swing now i'm not standing outside now i'm actually sitting in the swing already and i can mm-hmm. kind of yes. like go go with it and then, <laughs> <laughs> very interesting oh yeah. beautiful. there's something very something very beautiful between what we all have been saying that I think is very important as far as the process of under coming to this understanding is that Dan, you were saying that once I've done my work, I'm able to hold this space of love, right? It's, it's something that's innate within me. I'm not doing love. I'm being love. And what Jan said previous to that, which was, if we practice this, like, is this measurable? How do we understand how this actually works? When you do the process of doing the inner work, and you become that which you seek to desire, what happens is that there's not so much of a seeking to embody something, but a much more clear knowing when you decouple from that which you are. So that being said is, you know, when I know something, I know something. But when you embody that work, you also are more open and free to say, I actually don't know this, or I'm not sure about this, or this is not resonating with me. I have to do a little bit of adjusting here. So it's kind of like everything that we know and how we've been operating inverts slightly. And it becomes more clear and obvious when we decouple from that which we already are, but we have to first embody or remember that which we already are. That makes sense. Beautiful. It makes a lot of sense and it connects. Like I, I'll, I'll shut up in a second. I'm just really getting excited here. <laughs> there is, um, there is, there is the experience of resonance, and there is an intention. And so, if there is an awareness that I'm in the resonant field, I'm in resonance with, or I'm not in resonance with the field. If there is an awareness of that, of, of where, where, what is the current state, then that means I can also be aware not only for myself, but I can also be aware for my environment. So as I'm a healthcare professional, I can see, am I in resonance with the patient or not? Yeah. Is, there, is there this instant connection that Ruby, that you described? Like, boom, we just, we just know. <laughs> is that there? And, and if it's not there, what might be, you know, is there something that I can do from a point of awareness, not from a point of the illusioned um, separate state of separation, but from the point of awareness of non-resonance, what might be the enabling environment that I can create or that I can allow to occur? Or what, what, what is that then? No, I'm not. <laughs> that sounds like, or that just, I just want to say one thing, which is that sounds like you said it already letting it happen versus trying to force it to happen and trying to make it happen. <laughs> so, sorry. And so. something important, no, it's okay. Something important is that, again, those who we easily resonate with are not our greatest challenge. Those are in our lessons mm-hmm. to become better. So if we resonate easy with somebody, that's, that's not necessarily the- growth. I'm not saying that it's not that, it's a pleasure. But those who come into our field who we feel non-resonance with are the actual circumstances and people that we need to discover within us, which feels disconnected from that, from that unresonance. Yeah. Stephanie, you, what you're sharing is incredible in the kind of our understanding, because I think what this is leading to is you've get a lot of, you know, physicians were trying to, okay, so what, what do we do? How do we do this? Okay. And it's really kind of that understanding kind of the inner work that now allows us to realize that we're stepping out of the way. But what you're saying also earlier is, look, if the patient is showing up with that understanding or that belief of how do I get well and being fully present, it doesn't take as much because we know that when someone or something, or now we understand that it just is a resonant field. So I could walk out back to the idea of nature and just harmonize vibrate at that frequency and allow that to take over my being, get out of the way completely. And now you're completely supercharged in that way. Mm -hmm. The same thing can happen if someone is actively showing up. And this is the connection from last time where it's like, you know, meaning and purpose. It's like, you know, they part of their own soul's evolution has brought this interaction together. And this is someone who wants to get well and is fully present. Well, then it sure is easy 
to get out of the way and allow full presence to allow you to bring yourself into presence. It's like magnet or someone doing Reiki or a chakra balancing or any one of the number of things, because you're allowing the, the energy that exists anyway of a patient that wants and desires that because the intention that Jan just kind of highlighted that I had said exists. It already exists because there is the interaction. So whether those are challenging <laughs> or simple, each one of those is a resident field. So now bringing it closer to kind of what to do, you know, now we could step out of the way completely and allow ourselves to harmonize. So the residence is not what I would have come into this call saying, oh, because of the powerful work that I am doing, <laughs> <laughs> I am allowing myself to get out of the way and I'm surrendering the experience. And so now I'm bringing, I'm bringing someone up. Not at all. It just completely switched where it's like, you know, just showing up and having someone in need and present allows me to harmonize with that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. This is exciting. If I can say something to the collective doctor out there from a collective patient point of view, please, everybody listen intently. I'm trusting your education that you have to take care of me well before you even walk in the door. I'm trusting the fact that you have an MD behind your name. Please just show up as yourself. You don't need to prove anything to me. If there's a sense of that egoic nature coming through, it's actually something that may need to be integrated within yourself. I, you've got an MD, you're my doctor. I'm fully trusting that you, your education is you're embodying that education and you're going to do the best that you can. There's nothing within me as a patient that feels as though you as a doctor don't have the education to do it. It's just a matter if you're willing to show up fully as yourself to be there for me. Mm. We love you guys. That's the truth. We really do. We just need to have a better relationship. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that permission is necessary. Thank you. Receiving from the collective <laughs> in that space. Thank you for that permission. It is so deeply needed. And as you're saying it, what allows us to let go of is actually a pharmaceutically driven a medical legal system, business entering into medicine, all of these things that pull at us and take us away from our inherent nature. Mm -hmm. So, but with a human to human connection from the eye to eye becoming we, I hear you, we hear you to allow that to become who we can be to show up for who you can be. And that's mm -hmm. a totally different place that exists and it has not existed in medicine for some time that I have seen. So thank you, thank you. Dan, that was direct channeling. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanna say that I this is what I feel in my every iota of my being, that when we show up, the call is out there, they're here. The patient called us out right now, just now. If we show up, the system has to change because mm -hmm. you just did the main three things. Mm -hmm. The system has to change. That call that you all had to go into medicine, to me, would make it clear that you are a natural healer. And there's aspects of the system that have conditioned you out of that innate knowing. So there has to be just a remembering that you're healthcare professionals, but you're also healers. And you need to disconnect from the ways in which you can't show up as a healer and a healthcare professional. Just a couple of days I took to an intensivist, a very experienced senior intensivist. And I asked him, said, what do you think, you know, now looking back at your career, where you started, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, <laughs> and where you are now? And do you feel that, and, and what do you feel is the proportion of technology and knowledge on the one hand, and showing up as a human being and companion and guide for the patient on the other? How much of what you do is actually conducive to healing that you see in your intensive care unit. And he says, well, it's become so incredibly technological. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you become senior on top of it, you actually uh, are less with the patient and you're more kind of coordinative uh, in your role. And so he says, I have very little um, opportunity to practice real medicine. That was his words. I'm like, Oh, so what is real medicine then, right? He says, well, it's 
when we actually interact with the patient. And in our world now in the intensive care unit, it's the, it's the nurses who do this more than we do. And we are more like just, you know, breaking bad news or breaking news or sharing, you know, prescribing stuff. We're very technical. We're very much part of the technical mm -hmm. environment. And uh, I was really touched by the fact that somebody who's very experienced and has seen life and death every day, very, very, uh, you know, intensely and clearly. And so has, has learned to value aliveness <laughs> from this perspective has actually is is recognizing that that an over technification of um of medicine is actually not real medicine mm. that is so it's interesting really, it's interesting that we call medicine the same thing we call people take in pharmaceuticals it's mm. kind of interesting mm -hmm. the other thing that what you just said that's so very interesting is that this ability to remember how important it is to be in personal connection with, with people. Mm -hmm. Something that Ruby and I discuss a lot is um, the availability for the development of consciousness as a form of healing mm -hmm. over getting more technological. Uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not against uh, per se something like uh, for working on health and healing, something like uh, plant medicine, but why are we leaving out just the basic aspects of the evolution of human consciousness and connection? Why aren't we talking about that? Because that's such a powerful catalyst for health and healing. Yes, it is. So we we talked about compassion and we differentiated compassion from empathy. And when we talked about empathy, we talked about that that's to do with I feel what you feel. Kind of I feel your feelings. I'm, I'm in your feelings. <laughs> Participate in your feelings. Now, and, and compassion was more about... Um, I am here for your subjective experience. And now we're looking at resonance, which could have to do with empathy. Like kind of the immediate idea is like, ah, oh, yeah, if you if I'm sad and then you feel my sadness, then we're in resonance, right? But here we're talking about a different kind of resonance. Um, is And now you're bringing up the term of consciousness. So that, help me understand this. So how does our... Or when we say resonance is our original state, and we also say consciousness is our primary state, and we also say love is our primary state, like how do they relate? Like what is going on there? I think it speaks to, and I take this from multiple cultures of indigenous wisdom, but it's really this idea of that we are innately whole, that we are sacred beings, that we are full completely and it's our life experiences it's trauma it's it's movement that starts the patterning and the shifting away from what is a profoundly um beautiful state and so i think if you think of it in those terms that's why these it becomes almost complicated where you're putting in these different things because you know what is the interrelationship between love between vibration, between resonance, between consciousness, like at some level, like if you were in the know, you would be laughing at the question because it's like all of those, like love has a vibrational resonance that is consciousness itself. And so it is a different place. It is a place of full abundance. And so all of that is happening at the same time. And then we are born, we have that innate capacity for that. That is what healing in nature is. And it doesn't, what happens to us is we get into the point of because we're living in our own beings, it's challenging to see life and death. As I said, oh, that's the resonant field within nature. Those are all a part of it. The fire that moves the forest away allows the mycelium networks to get stronger. And then the growth of new growth comes and it moves through and it's complex. It is actually flowing energetic aliveness. Mm -hmm. And so when to take each one of those as a definition, I mean, it's profound and it really helps us and the audience to figure this out. But I think at a fundamental nature, it exists together. And so, you know, if I find a field in my life, it's like, oh, love is the resonant field that allowed my expansion of consciousness. So I pull those together and just kind of hold one of them, but it could be interchangeable. If for you, it needed to be something else as that coherent field, but all of it exists in the same. 
I would like to say to simplify and maybe some action steps people could kind of investigate that may be useful is you have to feel it to heal it. You have to merge with it to be able to provide an impact. And I think there is an immense amount of fear and we've been told to keep a boundary and separation because we forgot how multidimensional and broad we are in our abilities to handle the chaos and the bliss. Life is everything. It's life, it's death, it's everything. Ruby and I were talking about this form of being empathic earlier today. And we were saying the empath doesn't necessarily need to change, right? What they need to be do is that what they need to do is ha- recognize their ability to feel deeply, to help heal while not compromising themselves. So it's not like we want to change or compartmentalize ourselves out of truly connecting and being very deep. We just have to realize that life is so much broader than we realize. And when we try to put it into compartments or we have fear of what it's going to look like if we're fully open, we're actually diminishing the beauty of the space of that field where any and all possibilities can exist. We're putting limitations on the potential of the healing when we're compartmentalizing uh, the depth at which we can feel connected or be exposed or be ourselves as this professional. I think if we start to look at each other more as equals, and this is something when I used to play the yoga teacher, I would do this all the time, is I would say, no matter who walks through the door, something is there for me to learn. And every practitioner could look at, use that same philosophy and say, no matter who's coming through this door, there's a reason for it. There's a reason or a season as to why this is happening. Instead of thinking that you're a victim to a a patient that's not in resonance with you Mm -hmm. or that's complicated is to say, everybody that comes in my field is meant to be there for some reason and for me to learn. And as long as I'm open to this mutual learning from each other, even though I have the expertise, you both win. So, and it's, it's much more simple to just show up as yourself than to try to let the mind take over as it starts to compartmentalize your potential for being a healer in that moment, not just for them, but for your own self as well. Five minutes. We're coming full circle, kind of, (laughs) that you're now highlighting the importance uh, or the if you like the dangers, the pitfalls of of mentalization, of differentiation, or is it empathy, or is it compassion? Do we call it love, or maybe is it cohere? You know, like so the that is entertaining the same mechanism supporting a sense of duality and separation, whilst mm-hmm. uh, the the flowing energetic aliveness, mm-hmm. whatever name we want to give it, or whatever aspectual kind of different colors of splendidness it may have um that is that is clearly and and kind of unequivocally experienceable and and we can say this is we we now experience it or 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 we don't Mm -hmm. we all have to learn how to trust ourselves yeah if we have full trust in what we do there's going to be that over mentalization of it. So if there's something about an individual, a patient or a practitioner who's not trusting the experience, please go back into the self to get confident again, do what you need to do so you can trust yourself. Because when there's not a sense of trust, that's when we really start to break down and doubt and question. And then our mind goes everywhere. Perfect. (laughs) And to not even judge you to not even judge that because look, we know that there's afferent and efferent connections between the heart and the brain. And so it is, we're meaning making machines. And so of course we're going to experience and try to figure out what those words are to create the expression of the experience we're feeling. And that's Mm -hmm. natural, which is why trying to uncover is helpful for others to actually hear this type of work, hear us try to figure it out because then they can figure it out for themselves. Mm-hmm. That's the perfect segue to our next conversation, which is about self-awareness. Ah. So what is that self mm-hmm. <laughs> that we want to become aware of so that we can create an enabling environment, a healing environment that is conducive to this flow state, to this abundant aliveness that is actually who we are and that we want to return to as a as a healing process wow beautiful thank you so much this is going to be a wonderful next round when we talk about 
self-awareness in that sense. Thank you. Thanks for joining. This is exciting. Thank you. So grateful to be together. Thanks for listening to this Heart of Healthcare podcast brought to you by Heart-Based Medicine. If you enjoyed the conversation, you'll find some free resources and more information at heartbasedmedicine.org. Please share this episode if you feel inclined and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, thanks and take care.